Let the darkness be your light Leave behind these rings of sorrow I had a good life as a child. Your hands have held the oceans tight Squeeze drops of rain upon the lawn <laughs> We get up in the morning and kind of didn't want to take time to eat and went to the river and just even to go outside and smell the river. We loved uh, outside. I had a really good, um, happy childhood. Come I sing on morning's breeze One of the things that we really enjoyed doing at home in the summertime, uh, my mother and father were very musical and he, he played the guitar and my mother played the piano. And we used to sit out on the uh, front um, veranda and uh, he would uh, strum on the guitar and we'd all be singing. And we, it was like putting on a little concert for the neighborhood. <laughs> but it's something that we really enjoyed doing, and uh, it was a nice pastime, and uh, we, uh, uh, that brought us close together. My mother made baskets, all kinds of baskets, uh, laundry baskets, which were normally at least three feet high. And my brother and I, this is the middle brother, uh, we used to play hide-and-seek all the time, and so... I hid in the basket because I was the younger child, and he just couldn't find me. And I remembered my mother telling me to be quiet, and because I was in there a long time, because he couldn't find me, and I wanted to get out. I see myself in, in, on Sundays. My dad and mother would get the Detroit Free Press, and my mom would be laying on the bed with us, and reading to us probably when we went to bed. Before I ever started school, we, um, uh, I used to help my mother do beading, and we would go into town. Mind you, we walked from the reserve all the way uptown because there was no bus service at the time. They had these big, huge homes along Christina Street, and I used to think, well, those people just came here to this country. How can they afford to live in such big, huge houses? as compared to the little shacks that we lived in. I used to be quite amazed at the uh, difference between their lifestyle and ours. And so I used to think, well, it, to me it seemed like it took money. And to get money you had to work. So I decided uh, what I really wanted to become was a nurse. I was... Um, quite young when I had decided that was what my career was going to be. And um, then I thought, well, I would be able to afford to build a nicer home for our family and so forth. But uh, things didn't turn out that way. It was of an age where we still had our ties with our... Um, use of Indian medicine and uh, was, that was ordinary too. When we got sick, the, um, you know, my mother took care of us and my grandfather, he knew, you know, herbs and stuff like that. People here got dressed up in their Indian regalia and they'd start off marching when, as the Putin Bay was landing, or whatever the passenger ship, there were different ones. They'd start off and march about a block from my house along River Road, go by my house, into the fairgrounds, into the bandstand. When I did start school, I didn't know that much English. N none of the kids did. We were all, uh, we all spoke our own language. And um, 
when uh, the teacher would try and give us instructions, it was difficult for us to understand her. And of course, she didn't know our language either, so uh, she would become really frustrated with us, and she told us we were all too stupid to learn. When I told my father about uh, the teacher saying we were too stupid uh, to be uh, to learn anything, he became very angry and he went to chief and council and he took me out of school and he um, uh, took me to Mount Algin Residential School in Muncie. I was only there for the um, from September till June and the school closed down that June so uh, my parents came and got us and took us back home. But it wasn't uh, like other schools. Uh, parents could come and visit on the weekends, and this school was right on the reserve. So uh, people felt free to come, like parents and relatives, free to come to that school and visit. So I always saw somebody from our community, and uh, that made it uh, uh, not so uh, lonely and uh, uh, we didn't feel as if we were totally abandoned or anything there. When I came home, uh, that year I was away, they had built a new school on the reserve. And w it was a much larger one. It had four classrooms and uh, they had four different teachers, not the same one that was here before. My father was quite happy with that. And um, then he died that first year I was home. Uh, in the early spring, he died. And it was very sudden, so that was uh, very traumatic for us. And then my mother um, uh, was diagnosed with tuberculosis, so she was in hospital for long term. I was 11 at the time, and uh, they figured I could fend for myself, so I did. And uh, what I used to do... Uh, I used to go across the road to my neighbor and ask if I could do any work for her to earn a bit of money to buy some food. And she was kind enough to give me, uh, uh, she had a lot of children, so there was always a lot of ironing, and she would get me to do the ironing. So I got by that way for a few months, but then the Indian agent came and collected us all and put us on the train and uh, he warned us that we cannot get off until we get to Branford. He said, the conductor will be watching you, so you're to stay in your seats until you get to Branford, which we did. And um, then that began my experience with the Mohawk Institute in Branford. Right. I was four and a half when I was taken from my front yard to be uh, put into the residential school system. And I was standing at the fence which I often did apparently because my mother uh, worked across the river and so did my aunt, her sister. And she saw me all the time standing by the fence. And my brother that was two years older, he had more memories of those days than I did. He was uh, six, a little over six when they took him. They, they took us on the same day, but we arrived at the school a day apart. And if you had been a brother and sister, at that time they would have uh, um, separated you as you walked in the front door. My dad got a job down the lake at, uh, at the Canada Club and on Bassett Island, which means in the winter you couldn't get up here. The river froze. It froze so hard some cars could drive along the shore on, on the river. I could not get up here to school, so it was out of my parents' hands. The Indian Act had also said that all Indian children um, must go to school or their parents could be jailed. We were Crown Boards until 1961. You know, you don't really believe your life is going to change. So we had no choice. Us three older kids had to go to school, and um, on November 9th, 1943, I was nine years old, we were told we were going to Mohawk Institute.
There wasn't any choice as to whether I would go or not. Uh, the taking of the children was based on uh, the settlers' uh, value system. They felt that if a mother and father were not in the home all the time, then they were uh, not a what I call a regular home. And in our situation, as many on Wapol Island, grandparents lived with you. And in our culture, it is part of the grandparents' responsibility to raise children, which uh, since getting older and older, I think that's a very good idea. They have more patience and they're a lot wiser. That day when we got on the train, I see myself in my mind's eye crying and inconsolable and because uh, it was just us four kids going. And, um, and my older sister was trying to comfort me and my brother. The principal met us at the train and uh, took us to the school. It's a long driveway. If you ever go to the Mohawk Institute, and uh, I mean, I'm used to trees all over the place on the island, but to see these places, you know, where there's big buildings and this long lane again, like probably a two-car lane, lined with trees on both sides, and this big building at the end and we had to go into what was the visitor's room. And the principal separated uh, us from my brother. He said when we came there, we would be able to see it, have a visiting day, I think, once a month. In my three and a half years there, I think that might have happened once. They didn't even want you making eye contact. Well, and when we're sitting in the, um, you know, we had prayer service every evening, we'd be in the same room. No, you couldn't go over and say, hi, Dave. No way. You could not. I mean, you'd get a strapping. And when you witness a few strappings, you know you just don't want that to happen to you. The very moment I saw the principal... Uh, who is also the the minister there? I had a uh, an immediate reaction, uh, sort of instinct. I knew that uh, I couldn't trust him, and uh, I didn't know why. I just had this feeling. I was forever being sent up to his office and being strapped, and they were severe, severe straps. Um, he would hit down as hard as he could. He would even get up on his tiptoes to have as much strength and as much leverage to come down as hard as he could. It was hard for me in Brantford because uh, at home, if I struggled, I had my mother to help me. There, you better darn well learn decimals and fractions or whatever the heck they are, and you did it on your own. I wasn't a bad kid. I used to do all my assignments. I, I did okay in school, and uh, uh, I, you know, I didn't start any trouble of any kind. So I thought maybe he just wants to break my spirit. And and if people wanted to talk Indian, they'd have to go and sneak around somewhere. Um, and if they were caught, they were strapped, and uh, and they. Some principles were worse than others. Some were, you know, they really liked to make your arm and hands, um, you know, they wouldn't, I think what was allowed was, you know, a few straps on your hand, I don't know how many, whether it's five or 10, but some of them would, you know, hit you on your here. And, um, and those kids would have, you know, swelled up limbs. I know for sure the uh, uh, punishment we received was far excessive to what was legal at that time. Uh, four strappings, uh, four lashes uh, was all that they were allowed to give. 
we had a cubby hole under the stairs and there was a cubby hole on both uh, the boys side and the girls side and it was a isolation punishment you were put in the cubby hole if they uh, felt you did something severe and speaking your own language was one of those things and it was a cubby hole about uh, four feet uh, square I would say in dark no light in there and you were given bread and water I remember Looking out the window, you could go to a, a bed and look out an open window. And I looked down there, and I could see these boys down there. And then it looked like little piles of dust. And I thought, what the heck? Then I realized what was happening. These little boys are fighting. And the big boys are pushing them if they didn't want to fight, forcing them to fight. And even as a kid, I was appalled. It was a very depressing um, atmosphere to be in because you never knew when you were going to be attacked or by whom. So I found it very, very depressing. Oh, I forgot to tell you one thing when you get there. You're assigned a number. Yeah, 21. My sister was 20. You didn't have a name anymore. You had a number. So you felt like you were a, a prisoner. You know, all of this is so, uh, I don't realize it before, so horrible. It brings back those old um, feelings. And uh, to me, the hard part was having to witness um, today, I would say the abuse of, of other kids. And I used to get between 10 and 15 on each hand. And I used to be ready to faint practically. And uh, I would always uh, stand against the door so I could feel the doorknob. And if I ever reached a point where I was nearly collapsing, I would... I had in mind that I would grab that doorknob and get out of there because I didn't want to pass out and faint in front of that minister because I was afraid of what he would do. I didn't trust him. What he would do? Yeah. Like more punishment or? Well, molesting. That's what I was afraid of. And we're survivors because it does take survival skills to live through something like that. I learned that you had to have survivor skills just to live every day. And so that's what we developed throughout those years. I think it was my own nature and stubbornness that uh, saw me through it and has uh, uh, seen me through life. Um, and I think because I was 11 before I was exposed into that environment. I knew it was really very wrong, but yet there was nothing I could do about it. I just had to suffer and endure it. One of the first letters my mother wrote to me, she said, um, you know, you can stay, you know, you can stay there all year if you want, or, you know, you can come home in the summer. Oh my God, we thought, don't leave us here. We stayed alive, let's put it that way. We stayed alive? Yes. There's 123 children buried in the cemetery behind my school, my brother being one of them. It could have been for any reason at all. They say that there's 50, somebody mentioned this figure, 50% of children uh, were killed in residential school. 50% of the children were not killed at Shingwalk. I know that for a fact. But there were a lot of children that died for different reasons. So I think that um, you learn those skills without really realizing why. And I can see it in my grandchildren now how they rely on me as a grandparent. No one ever told us if uh, a child had gone. You never, they were there one day and then they were gone the next. You never really knew what happened to them. Nobody ever said anything to us. We were never informed. There are still stories that have not been heard. And uh, I think more, uh, I should say experiences rather than stories, because they are true. We didn't have winter coats. When we went around to our classroom, 
You went outside, if you've been to Mohawk, you know where the door is, went out that door, ran up that little hill, and you'd run around to your off your schoolroom. And then when I came back, I went right straight into the lavatory in the winter and put my hands in the sink and would run hot water over them to warm up. I remember one time one of the girls had run away, but she had been brought back. And she was shamed in front of the in the dining room, in front of all the kids, uh, about her behavior. And uh, uh, she was whipped in front of all the kids. And whenever you see anybody being attacked like that, it's like you're being punished as well. So it was very, very dismal. It wasn't a, a happy place at all. None of the kids seemed to be happy. and. No wonder, you know. You worked half a day, and you went to school half a day. The boys, they worked the farm, and the girls, they did all the washing, mending, and uh, scrubbing, and whatever, and cooking. So we were the ones that took care of the building. We had to scrub the floors and uh, everything. And I remember this so clearly because this was one of my first jobs when I got there. Fill a laundry tub full of cold water and throw in a lot of potatoes, get a scrub brush, and, and start scrubbing those potatoes. And you'd be up to here in cold water. One of my jobs, my first jobs, was washing dishes. If you can imagine washing dishes for around 200 kids, you know, that's a lot. It takes a lot of time. And then uh, I also worked in the uh, dining room for the staff. And their food was so much, it was so tantalizing. It was torture, really, to work there because well, the food they got was so different from what we had. And they had their own chef prepare their food. So there was a huge difference. You know, we're half starved there. We haven't even talked about the diet there. But let's just say everybody was half starved there. The food was no good. We were fortunate my mother would send us guys a package on Christmas and Easter at least. And, uh, you know, then we'd have lots of buddies. Well, we had to work half a day and go to school half a day. And uh, they taught us the three R's. We had teachers who were um, very good at uh, encouraging us and challenging us to learn different things. And so there were uh, good teachers, but the ones that had to take care of us physically and emotionally, they were usually spinsters. They had never been married, never had children, didn't know how to do those things. And I know that because when I got out of there, uh, and I married within two years, had children. I didn't know how to take care of them, and that's when I related that to those uh, young women who were there at the schools taking care of us. The only time we would see her would be um, uh, when she would come down to blow the whistle for us to line up for meals. So that's how come uh, a lot of kids could get into trouble fighting each other and get away with it uh, because we didn't really have good supervision. In those days, this was 1941 to 1953, they had to get permission from Ottawa to go to the doctor, for to take a child to the doctor. If they pulled your teeth, they, they would wait till they were bad enough, they would lay you at, on the kitchen table and pull them out with a pair of pliers. So uh, when you say, could, they, uh, could these kinds of actions been prevented? I think the goal in those, I mean, I know the goal in those days was to uh, kill the Indian and the child, get rid of the Indian problem. They didn't out and out have a plan to um, exterminate each one individually, but if it happened, there was never any sorrow about it. We were called names that I know uh, what they thought of us, and so like you dumb Indian, you stupid Indian, you're not good for anything. And when you look at uh, the uh, goals in the old records of uh, Shingwak anyway, it says, oh, we're trying to make them into farmers and housekeepers, and they'll be good to do that. So we know what they thought of us at the time. They could have given us a lot better care. I think the emotional abuse is far worse than the physical abuse even that the children endured during that time. 
if we were to write home, we were never to say anything about uh, the uh, staff or the school. And so that uh, you learned that you had to um, be secretive about what went on at the school. And it also taught you to um, uh, not to share, I guess, any information. And I think that's why a lot of students, when they came home, they never ever talked about the school because we were already conditioned not to. And uh, so our letters to home would be very skimpy. There was not much you could say. We came out in June, and by now remember my kid brother's with us. He wouldn't eat. We wondered what's wrong. At le you know, at least you'd have candy or something if you don't want to eat food, and because that was about a four-hour trip. He wouldn't eat. We got home. Here his mouth was sore, bleeding. My mom took him to the doctor. He had trench mouth. I would sit outside every day, and we went to school to the end of June. I would sit outside every day waiting for somebody to come and get me. And nobody would come and get me day after day. And my mother by then, I say she uh, gave up the job of being a mother because all her children had been taking, taken away. And she didn't know how to be a mother because she was taken away and put in residential school. So at the end, I would sit there by the big tree on the girl's side waiting for my ride to go home. And I finally went to the principal and I said, I think it's the law that when you put these kids in school, you have to make sure they get home when they're finished. And he said, I think you're right. So he bought me a bus ticket to go to Detroit. But from that, I learned that I had the abandonment issue. Uh, when you come home, like you're so, you're such an uptight person because of all the restrictions that you had at the school. And uh, you're also full of anger. And you sort of lose that family connection. I, um, I knew it wasn't my mother's fault, but yet I took it out on her. I was so angry. And um, it kind of, it spoiled our relationship. I never had a, a closeness with her after that. And uh, it's as if I were blaming her for the situation we were in, but yet I knew in my head it wasn't true, but it was just a total family breakdown. Anyway, she had to um, board me out and she, to another home and she laughed because the situation was really bad at home. I couldn't stand a lot of things and and it's all that anger that I felt at the school. I was taking it out on her. When I got home I was 16 and probably feeling my oats, to, so to speak. I didn't want to do anything illegal or immoral, but I did want to be on my own, and I was used to being on my own. So within a, a, a month or a month and a half, I told my mother I was moving out. And so I moved to the only place I knew in downtown Detroit, which was the YWCA. And when I went there, they said, I can't live there. Uh, and I asked why, and they said, you're only 16 and you'd be called a runaway. And so all that day, it was a holiday, legal holiday, and all the offices were closed, but I even had to wait to get permission to live in a place just like I had more or less escaped from. But once I moved there, I was very happy. I, my job was two blocks away, and beyond that two blocks was my mother. So I did see her every day. I went home for lunch uh, on my uh, noon hour, but we never developed a relationship. And on her uh, deathbed, so to speak, a week before she died, we were walking down the hall in the hospital. And she looked at me and she said, I'm, I'm sorry, Sue. And I, I really didn't know what to do with that. I, I didn't know if it meant for something she felt like she had just done or for my whole life. And so I didn't do anything. I didn't respond, I didn't say anything. I don't even think I had a facial expression.
As angry as I was, I knew I had to do something uh, to try and heal myself. There was no such thing as going to a, a psychiatrist or a counselor of any kind. That wasn't available to us. And uh, so you had to look for ways and means to deal with uh, your issues. And uh, my escape was uh, music and reading. You, try, you read books to see, well, what is normal in life, you know? It's, uh, because certainly our experience we had certainly was anything but normal. I guess the neglect of teaching this in the school system is really surprising not only to me when I found out about it, but also the staff and the students nowadays. I had a student ask me last year, if the government isn't allowing this to be taught in the school system, what else are they holding back from us? And I thought that was very profound because he was a young man. He hadn't even, he wouldn't graduate from uh, secondary school till this year. And so I thought these are young, bright people that are coming out of high school. Much different than 10 or 20 years ago where we took our education for granted and believed everything that was taught us. And we can't do that as Canadian citizens or we as Native people. We've got to be uh, questioning, we've got to be researching, we've got to learn our history. I heard that uh, students from um, uh, Branford were organizing a class action suit uh, against the uh, church and against the government. I elected myself to represent this community because nobody else in this community ever talked about residential schools. No one. And uh, it seemed to me I had to educate a lot of people uh, when they would ask me questions, you know, why their parents were so mean, and I had to explain. So I did go to council, uh, chief and council, and I spoke to them about the conditions at the school and what the students had to endure. And I said, and I see a lot of uh, negative uh, uh, behavior in the community, a lot of dysfunction. Uh, and I'm, I said, I'm positive, it's because of the residential schools. And so anyway, that's how I became involved um, with that class action suit. Um, I thought um, not only my community needs to know, uh, all of Canada needs to know. There's no history about it in the books. Uh, when I was going to high school, there was never anything said about it and certainly not in public school either, but um, it just seemed uh, it's a part of history and a very traumatic history in Canada of what people had to endure here. And so uh, in order to uh, get that knowledge out, it seemed the only way they would listen is if we sued. And so uh, we went through various courts until we reached the Supreme Court of Canada. And they uh, had said, yes, we had a legal right to uh, uh, sue, and uh, we had a good case. People have asked us, well, how much money do you want? What can we do to fix this? And I say that uh, four generations of people from our community went to residential schools, so you aren't going to fix it overnight. You could um, say four generations it will take to uh, cure up some of the problems, but I'm not even sure of that. They really fractured our uh, First Nations people, their spirit and their souls. Uh, and the younger you are as a child when you're exposed to that, the more devastating the effects. As I was learning the uh ins and outs of this residential school system and why we are the way we are. I realized the dreadful impact that the breaking up of the families um, was to our community and to the 600 other First Nations across Canada. And so I realized that I never knew my brother. I remember being at his funeral 
and I was about uh, a little over five at that point, and I wondered who that was in the box. And I realized why my mother was the way she was, because she went to residential school. So it isn't so much of the fact that I mourned his death, because I didn't know him. He was uh, really nobody to me except a body in, in a box. And so I started looking at all of the things that happened to us as First Nations people. And my field of work was in social services. So when I look at all the impacts that we endured over those uh, things that happened to us at the schools, it made a connection for me on uh, why we are the way that we are. Uh, it just broke up communities and uh, it's still going on. It's intergenerational and I think it'll take a few more generations yet before that cycle is completely broken. I went to uh, Ottawa when the uh, Prime Minister offered a, an apology. It was um, a mixed feeling about that because uh, knowing that it wasn't really a sincere apology, he had to be coerced into giving that. Uh, there was a lot of pressure put on him. And knowing that, you know, it's... Uh, uh, I was thinking, well, hopefully uh, the rest of Canada believes him. <laughs> and certainly the other uh, parties who pushed to have this apology brought forward. They certainly uh, felt we deserved that apology. So anyway, it's uh, it was a beginning, of just a beginning of uh, teaching the rest of Canada what happened at the schools. Enter now thy sacred place. Hear the distant make a Turn thy spirit to its grace It's the beauty of the dead Not only were we crying there, so were our parents. Can you see what it did to our community? Yeah. Yep, it was to break the strength of our people. Just <laughs> as death shall bring us peace, let the sacred spell reverse. Return my spirit to its grace, and lift me from this hollowed curse. Our love shall never be undone. 